I'm Chris Bray. I'm chairman of the Australia and New Zealand chapter of the New York-based Explorer Club. Our members are celebrated explorers and adventurers from around the world, and the couple in tonight's program are the very latest to be invited to join us. Mish and Kurt Jenner are marine biologists, and they've spent the last two decades at sea researching and mapping whales. And it's their discovery of a whale breeding ground off the Kimberley coast, which has plunged them right into the middle of a very topical debate about the future of that region. This is their story. Passion comes from spending time with whales. Their business is about finding mates, finding food, migrating enormous distances. The pleasure is ours to observe that and to watch that mm. and to think in a big picture sense, what can we do to preserve that? They're iconic animals. They live most of their lives underwater. And you can't really study the animals in their habitat as you would, for example, a moose or a deer or something like that. You just can't see them. To actually get a handle on what these animals are doing is very difficult and it's extremely expensive. And people generally have been very persistent and managed to keep going when other people just wouldn't have done. That's about the fourth subadult we've had do that this year. Just keep circling us and circling us, just having a look at us. They love their job, so their job is their life, and, uh, and so they're very, very lucky. Okay. Nothing phases Kurt, he's a very able seaman. Oh, I got sacks of dorsals. See that? See the light dorsal just there? He's rock solid in any situation, and Mish has got wonderful eyes. She can spot a whale where nobody else can. Here we go, here we go, coming up right now. He just goes berserk. It's like she'd never seen a whale before in her life, and she's been doing it the whole life. She's just like, oh, there's one, there's one, there's a whale. OK, right on the bow. <laughs> Get to her going. He's still just there, he's looking at us. I think obsessed is some, one of the words that some people <laughs> use to uh, describe us. I mean, kinder people say dedicated, I suppose, but uh, I think the reality of it is that we are very obsessed with the work that we do. So you see the two of them? In the course of their work with whales, they've discovered the birthing place in Camden Sound. We certainly knew when we had found this place that it was nothing like anything else anybody had ever seen. And so we made a conscious decision then to keep it a secret. Most scientists, when they discover something, it's immediately hit the press with the, with the revelation. It was extraordinary for two scientists to keep this secret for as long as they did, for 15 years. Humpback whales have unique pigmentation on the underside of their tail flukes, so they have a black and white marking that's like a fingerprint. They try and figure out what the population is and where individual whales are, and they do grid work to try to establish what's in the area that they're mapping. And both of them, of course, have years of experience of this, but they're mind-blowingly good at it. It's fascinating. It's like exploring. Every day on the water is different. There's not a single day uh, that you spend out in the office that's the same. 
if it could all be solved in a season, we'd be out of a job, wouldn't we, I suppose? So, uh, look, the, the mystery of these animals is what drives us to keep doing it. They've made it all available to the government, so the government typically fall back on, on maps that the Jenners have produced, where whales go and where they come from and when they're there. There's going to be plenty of whales around there. There's usually a lot of cow-calf pods there. So That's right. I was born in the prairies in Canada. I don't think I actually saw the ocean until I was 16. I was born in Sydney, and uh, when I was 15 months old, we moved to Auckland. I remember walking along the beach with my brother one day and I sort of said, now, what are you going to do when you grow up? And he said, well, I I'm going to be a marine biologist. And I thought, hey, that's a great idea, so will I. When I was doing a, a Bachelor of Science degree at university, I was more intent on skiing than, than actually doing studying. And, uh, and the <laughs> counsellor sat me down, as he, as he dutifully should, and said, look, what are your hobbies? What are you really good at? And I said, oh, geez, I really like fish. He says, oh. Well, I went from the bottom of the class to the top of the class in, in six months, and, and I'd found what I loved. I'd finished my bachelor's and master's degree, and then I went to Hawaii and then met Kurt there. She was actually hired as my boss. I, we were working for a, a non-profit research group in, a, in Hawaii at the time, studying humpback whales. I arrived and uh, there standing on the jetty was this uh, beautiful woman with some mail in her hand. And I said, oh, geez, this is a nice arrival to Hawaii. And then she introduced herself as Micheline. I thought, oh, this couldn't be so bad after all. We worked um, in Hawaii for about two years. We were looking for something more challenging. We liked studying humpback whales, and uh, we thought that one of the big gaps that was missing was that sort of work being done in Western Australia. We arrived in Western Australia in July 1990. It was a remote, unexplored part of the world in those days, and the, the field was wide open for them. I think I was 25 and you were 27. That's yes, right, very yeah. um, green around the gills, I think. Oh, this is the northwest Australian uh, blue bow. <laughs> it's my first fish. They started on Enderby Island looking to see what the migration of humpbacks was along the coast, north and south. Enderby Island was our five-star rustic research station. It was a 10 by 20 foot tin shed. We stored our equipment inside, we slept outside. Hello, Kurt. Hello, Dave. How are you this morning? Hello, Mish. There were no facilities. I can't remember what we did for fresh water. Uh, so that, you know, they, they had to have a, a, a rigorous regime to exist. What the Australians call the loo. This is a fine loo, a loo with a view. They only had a small zodiac. They would go out every day in this zodiac, out into the deep ocean, several miles offshore, wallowing around in the swell, looking for humpbacks. The first four days, we didn't see whales, and we were really worried. Yep. And uh, it took us about five days, and then there we go. Ah, oh, I've got a blow. There's blows behind us, pot of two. <laughs> I remember just jumping up and down in the boat and thinking, oh, I'm making too much noise. Oh, that was incredible. Oh, wow. Look out of the water. Whoa. Oh, he's got pink armpits. Everything we found out was new. Things weren't known about whales in that area or about the migration as such. So it was all about being in the right place at the right time. <laughs> Every year was a whole new financial kind of event. <laughs> they got the great ideas, but in limited funds. And so, so each moment was a leap of faith um, in the, towards the next. This is the single one yet, the bigger whale that we had. In the early days, it was literally, they were living off the smell of an oily rag. And uh, it was quite amazing they actually survived that. You're never going to die rich being a, a whale biologist, and it's not the sort of thing that you get into because you're interested in money, uh, you're interested in biology. This morning we had a whale coming in, and it's kind of like playing in the chocolate milk syndrome. <laughs> it's just really enjoying with all this uh, fish around. The funding that we get comes from uh, either the federal government, from industry, in dribs and drabs, and it comes from private individuals. 
it's a non-profit organization that we run in, and that's seriously how it ends up. This end of the computer. NDB Island was an early taste for us on how to do independent research and then managing, you know, all your personal affairs all the same time. So there was a lot of learning going on with all that. One of the things that we learned very quickly is that the calves that we were seeing going past there were about a month old. They could only find so much going going out and backwards with, with one or two tanks of fuel. And so, so I guess at that time they knew they needed a boat that, that could they could go and spend days or weeks on. A friend of theirs um, at Port Hedland, I think it was, was building uh, a catamaran. And one afternoon while we were over there looking at the plans with John, he said, you know, you need a yacht. I said, yeah, we're trying to figure out how we can put enough money together to buy a yacht. And he says, well, you don't need to buy one. Why don't you just build one? I said, well, there's one good reason, John. I'm a biologist, not a, not a builder. And he said, nah, look, can you cut a straight line with a saw? I said, well, yeah. And he said, oh, that's it. That's all you need to know. I'll, I'll show you the rest. We began building Whale Song in April 93 and took two years and then launched mm. in July 95. And that was actually the first home that I owned. So we sailed north to Broome, we picked up our first five volunteers and then went into the Kimberley, realising that we had arrived in heaven. This was just incredible. The first trip to Camden Sound, we found whales in huge numbers. We felt as if we'd gone into the nursery department of the hospital. All these babies there, all these mums just caring for their calves and in, in these incredibly tropical waters. It's 27 degrees in the water, and this represents a warm water haven for them to give birth to the calves, and that's a very special spot. The calves are born within a week, they're swimming 5,000 kilometers south, so the mother can get some food, uh, or the both of them will perish. So they need that um, gentle resting place where they don't get harassed, they don't get chased. There's a low chance they'll be separated. And they managed to established that that was the main breeding area of humpbacks off this coast. They were also able to map out where the uh, main migration routes were and how the whales would be behaving around um, oil rigs and things like that, which are proliferating up there. And they were very, very excited, but they were also very cautious. They really didn't want to bring it out into the world because they didn't want the world to, to flock there in a way. Places in the northern hemisphere that are calving places where they're actually born, they're inundated with tourists, they're inundated with people, and ultimately that's, that's a problem for those whales, and so we made a conscious decision then to keep it a secret. They lobbied for it to be set aside as a marine reserve, and they told the government, they tried to tell everyone who it would matter. Certainly the scientific community needed to know that this was the breeding centre uh, for that stock of whales. 